Hello, everyone. Uh, I'd also like uh, to um, thank you all for coming out today in person and thank all of you who are live streaming this event uh, this afternoon. It's the first time that a portion of our annual general meeting has been live streamed by supporters across the country. Uh, we're getting in the habit now of doing a lot of firsts at this organization and I'm going to walk you through uh, some of our um, some of our highlights of the past year, and before I do that, I'm also gonna tell you a little bit more about who we are as an organization. And I just wanna start with thanking uh, Jocelyn, Professor Jocelyn Downey for, for joining us here today. It's, uh, I don't actually have to explain the legislation, and you just made my job a little bit easier. So thank you so much. And I really wanna thank Leanna Britton, uh, for joining us today. It was no easy feat for her to come into Toronto uh, and uh, join us on stage and share her love for Paul and her love for her new family at Dying with Dignity Canada. And it's an honor and a privilege to have both of you here. Thank you. Thank you, Leanna. Uh, so, uh, just the sort of like the details of who we are and the many different volunteers that go into the work that you're about to see and get sort of a bit of a, a menu of. Uh, this work is not done by one group or even, you know, the staff. There are many groups of people across the country from coast to coast, uh, and many of you are in here in this room supporting the work that we do. We have 15 regional chapters, we have a physician's advisory council, many of whom are now uh, assessors for and providers for medical assistance in dying. Uh, of course, we have our disability advisory council that always reminds us of that disability lens that we have to use when we're talking about really sensitive issues at end of life. Uh, we have a legal advisory committee that's been uh, very instrumental over the past year, and their work is only going to grow in the years to come as more legal issues and court challenges come forward. And we have our Patrons Advisory uh, Council, a group of people, notable Canadians, who give us advice, who help support our work. And last but not least, we have our Board of Directors, a really committed group of volunteers that, so you know, gave up their weekend from places across the country to spend two days um, at a retreat, really helping us refine our vision and our mission uh, for the coming months and years ahead. So there's a lot of people that are behind our organization. And so let's start with the clinicians a little bit. Uh, Casey, Kelsey's gonna talk a little bit later about our volunteer program of the year. But one of the things that we found ourselves doing that we couldn't have imagined doing in 2015 when the Carter decision came down was providing a space, a venue for clinicians to do case sharing webinars. We've had eight in the past year in 2017 attended in total by 240 people or 240 times some of the same people are repeat attenders. Uh, but you can see the significance of us being now involved in this community of practice and really helping clinicians gain confidence in how they assess and provide medical assistance in dying. And perhaps one of the things I'm really most proud of in, in terms of a strategic partnership is with the Canadian Association of Made Assessors and Providers. They're a new association. In fact, they're going to be two years old in September of uh, 2018. And many of those, uh, the members and the founding board members of CAMAP, as it's known, are actually from Dying with Dignity Canada's own uh, Physician Advisory uh, Council. And I like to say that uh, Kelsey and I knew in August of 2016 that those BC doctors were going to go off and do something on their own. Uh, and they didn't know it until September of 2017 when they met in person at a Canadian Medical Association's conference. Um, and they did. They have done, gone off and done something of their own. And we've been able to do a number of joint statements in support of appropriate and fair clinician fees for people who do this sensitive and complex work assessing and providing. We've been able to issue a joint statement that says forced transfers for medical assistance in dying are wrong, full stop. Uh, and so I think we'll be able to do a lot more work together in the future. 
And you've heard a little bit about our independent witness program. What I love about that program is it's a grassroots program. Uh, and Sue Houston, who is in our um, audience today uh, from our Vancouver chapter, was one of the people that was instrumental along with members of our Victoria chapter when doctors started calling them in June of 2016, saying, we're having a problem finding witnesses. Our, witnesses ca our volunteers came to us and said, can we do this? And we were like, we don't know, <laughs> let's find out. We went to members of our legal advisory council. Uh, we created uh, a program that includes an agreement and a guide and there's ongoing training. And it's significant that our witnesses um, uh, witnessed, volunteers witnessed in 325 uh, requests in 2017. That is approximately five to eight percent of all made requests in 2017. And that doesn't count Quebec, Quebec because Quebec wisely decided that they will not have any independent witnesses. And that program is just growing. Uh, we're, I think, at 200 now, uh, and it's still only May, so it's, it just keeps growing. And it is, we discovered quite accidentally when we did this program, we had no idea of the profile it would have. We were just trying to do the right thing and help people who needed help. Uh, and without the witnesses, we're going to face uh, a real barrier to access. Uh, but we've discovered now it's the only program of its kind in the world. Uh, and it's now the subject of a new academic uh, research study. So more to come on that. Our chapters, as I have mentioned, um, are all across the country, and there's a lot of things I can say about our chapters, but I think perhaps the most important things is they are our bridge into local communities and their surrounding communities. They are our eyes and ears on the ground. They are the pulse of the nation when it comes to how people feel about assisted dying. They are involved in the independent witness programming. Some of them are actually so involved that health authorities directly call our chapter coordinators um, to get help with witnesses. They provide education um, on advanced care planning, patient rights, and of course, medical assistance in dying. And our profile would not be what it is today if it wasn't for the work of these incredibly dedicated volunteers, some of whom have been around for decades. Our legal advisory committee started in the fall of 2016, um, and they've been instrumental in supporting us um, in the CPSO challenge that Jocelyn mentioned earlier on effective referrals, a challenge that led to such a great decision that's being appealed, but I'm really pleased to say that Dying with Dignity Canada is going to seek leave to intervene in that, uh, in that challenge, and our pro bono lawyers are back with us again, and they're very eager to help support um, the CPSO with their, their policy. Uh, and as Jocelyn mentioned, uh, the Quebec challenge, uh, we are also intervening in that case. And I expect that will likely go to trial in the fall, perhaps the winter of, of this year. And we're partnering with our sister organization in Quebec, AQDMD, um, in that particular intervention. And AB uh, versus Canada. I'll talk a little bit more about AB in a few minutes. Um, but we were in the courtroom when the AB decision was heard because AB was someone that I provided personal support for. Um, and the impacts of that decision, Jocelyn mentioned that the Nova Scotia College guidelines have been amended to include reasonably predictable. Well, I have to tell you, the Nova Scotia College guidelines reference the AB decision. So the other work that we've been doing, exposing barriers, our Shine a Light campaign, bit of a brainchild of Corey Roof, our communications officer. Now he's filed Jocelyn numerous freedom of information requests across the country, and they usually quote him. And one of the things I can honestly say is Corey is a good negotiator because he will negotiate sometimes effectively the fees down to zero. I would take your 400 and something dollar bill and try to get a refund on that. Um, but as Jocelyn also mentioned, in Ontario, Organizations like ours, civil society organizations that are trying to hold government accountable so that they can be transparent in the delivery of government services. Healthcare is a delivery of government services. We're not 
able to access um, information about publicly funded healthcare facilities in this province. And that's something that's going to have to change. And of course, the work that we have done around forced transfers. And what I've been really pleased to see is that uh, the term forced transfers uh, is something that Dying with Dignity Canada came up with in January um, when I was reviewing a, jo a joint statement that I mentioned with the Canadian Association of Maid Assessors and Providers. It was originally titled something about institutional bans. I'm like, uh uh, no, no. Forced transfers forces us to look at the impacts of traumatic physically and sometimes very psychologically tra um, uh, traumatic incidents that do not need to occur. Forced puts the person at the center of attention. And our organization is a person-centered organization. And I'm really pleased to see other people, including Jocelyn, using that term, forced transfers, to put the attention and the focus where it should be on the person. And so, making the news. Yes, we've, uh, we've been involved, and there's a few in the back there if you get a chance uh, to take a look, a few of the headlines that we have been involved in the making of. Uh, and I'll tell you that it's so critical for average Canadians to be able to read these stories because it's the stories at the end of the day that are going to be what resonates with Canadians and what helps us sort of the next time um, the government, the lawmakers get to take a crack at the law. Um, we have to make sure that Canadians are well aware and well versed about good deaths, about deaths that are not good, about deaths where people had to go somewhere else to have an assisted death, about the problems that people encounter when they can't get the access they need, either because their clinician won't help them or because they just happen to end up in, a wrong, in the wrong facility. This is our sort of basic presence online, Facebook, Twitter, um, our email lists, which you'll notice have grown sharply in the last couple of years as a result of uh, very targeted um, uh, campaign, digital campaigning by our staff. I'll also tell you that our Twitter uh, feed is followed by journalists all around the world. Uh, and so our impact is actually much, much bigger than, you know, than us ourselves. And one of the things that uh, Jocelyn has told me about um, the personal support and the personal stories, because sometimes Jocelyn knows about the story because before it becomes a story, she always reminds me that it's those stories that give her the energy to keep going in the tireless work that she does. So we've seen a significant increase in the amount of personal support that we're uh, providing people. Uh, and it's also an increase in who's providing it. Uh, many of you do know Nino Sekapet, our personal support manager, uh, but Kelsey Goforth is pr providing it with the independent witnessing that's also turning into patient navigation. Uh, and our communications officers, Corey and Rachel, are helping people tell their stories um, on our blog and in the media. And I gotta tell you, there's a lot of support that has to go into that because we help people tell their stories within an ethical framework so that they fully understand what they are committing to and we give them support before they tell their story, as they tell their story, and after they tell their story. Uh, so many of us are involved in personal support and I also am involved and it's a privilege and an honor to do that work. So I'll walk you through a few of the highlights. I'll try to make this uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit quick if I can. Uh, the End in Mind series um, is a, a new program that we launched uh, in 2017. We wanted to know, you know, maybe people want education. Maybe they want to find out when we do an Ask a Doctor about medical assistance and dying. Um, maybe when we invite four digital storytellers, Leanna Britton was one of them, people will want to come. Well, when we did that uh, webinar with Leanna and three other storytellers, we had over 600 people sign up to watch that webinar and countless hundreds afterwards have watched that webinar. There is an appetite there. And so we're gonna continue on providing live streams when we can and webinars because Canadians want to know, they want to know about dying processes and about death. And we had this discussion at our board retreat this weekend about the word death and dying. And our organization is one of the best situated organizations in the world to take the discomfort of dying and death. I tell people all the time, 
own the discomfort because it's not until you own the discomfort that you can start to make it comfortable. And since death is coming to us all, this is an important cultural shift that we are actively participating in well and beyond medical assistance in dying. Uh, we spoke in front of uh, uh, the Ontario legislature on Bill 84. That's the one that doesn't allow us to file any freedom of information requests. Um, I'm sure we'll be speaking in front of more legislatures in the future. And uh, uh, we've heard today about the Canadian Council of Academies. I'll just tell you one brief story. Many of you probably know it. Uh, but when those panels were announced, the panel on advanced request, which for our supporters is the most important one because it deals with advanced requests for conditions like dementia, um, it was announced that Dr. Harvey Shipper was going to be the chair of that panel. And uh, we went to the media immediately because Dr. Harvey Shipper had made some comments about supporters of assisted dying and the right to die that at best were unflattering and at worst were just disgusting. Um, and so we, we went out, I didn't know, would it make a difference? We'll see. We asked for Dr. Shipper to clarify some comments he made in a Globe and Mail article in 2014. Who knew by 2017 maybe he changed his mind? Uh, Dr. Schiffer resigned as the chair of that panel. He is still on the committee, but I feel that we may have been helpful in neutralizing any undue influence that may have come from someone who was so opposed to assisted dying. We'd never done anything like that before, and it was really wonderful to see that the influence of our organization can matter in places of influence and power. Uh, in June, we were we were in court with uh, with AB. Um, AB was a woman, as Jocelyn mentioned, uh, with severe osteoarthritis, uh, and that decision, you know, and it's interesting because Jocelyn knew about that decision before it was going to be a decision. Uh, she was one of the people that I had looped in um, and to let her know that this was going to be happening, and I think was very helpful to my understanding of what was going to be happening in the courtroom that day. Uh, and A.B. was a woman I wish you all could have met. She was very folksy, she was friendly, she was com had a lot of compassion, and she had a lot of conviction. Uh, and on the day that the court decision came down, she, uh, she said to me, now, Shanaz, now can I have an assisted death? And I said, well, you know, I think so. It's pretty much what, you know, the, the judge in that decision, the first thing he did was say yes. In AB's case, she met the criteria that her death had become reasonably foreseeable, only to find out four days later that her clinician still wasn't comfortable providing an assisted death. And so she called me again and said, can you help me find another provider? And I said, I'll see what I can do. I'll call the local hospital. Um, and we did do that. And we did find her another provider at the local hospital. And on the day she died, I was with her. And the chief of staff of the hospital said to me, the AB decision changes everything. Now, AB does not solve the unconstitutionality of C-14, and it does not solve the deprivation of rights of people with significant disabilities who could live for decades, but AB has made a difference, I suspect, for hundreds of Canadians, and so we have to be thankful to that clinician who still couldn't make up his mind if he could go ahead and provide an assisted death to AB. And of course, we're involved with the, uh, the Quebec challenge. In July, uh, Corey Roof, our communications officer, who's never written a report like this, uh, wrote our challenges to choice, Bill C-14, one year later, to mark that anniversary. It's been widely read, and I think it really provided for our organization just another upping of our game in terms of being able to disseminate clear, concise, English-friendly, very friendly, accessible language to average Canadians to understand where we were at that time with the legislation. In August, we reactivated a campaign, Voice Your Choice, and this was in response to the submission to the Canadian Council of Academies studying advanced requests, mature minors, and mental illness for people who would otherwise not be eligible um, for medical assistance in dying. And 
we were stunned by the response. Uh, because see, the, the guidelines that we received from the CCA said you could have, I think it was like two single spaced pages, but you could include links uh, to articles. You could include things that come from uh, traditional knowledge. And so uh, we came up with the plan uh, that we would ask our supporters to make those submissions to tell and share their stories, their trauma, and their perspectives on these three issues. We received 746 letters, more than 500 were about advance requests. And I have to tell you, when uh, Corey came up with this plan, I said, oh, you the traditional knowledge criteria. And he said, no, it's evidence. The personal stories, this is sort of where I want to sort of leave you off. I think the year of 2018 is going to be known as the year of the personal story. And the stories that we share on our blog and in the media, as I mentioned before, that's what's going to move the meter. Because statistics matter, research matters, yes, the clinicians and their reports matter, and how the lawyers interpret legislation uh, and then provide guidance for implementation. All of those things matter. But will they matter enough to Canadians? No. What's going to matter the most to Canadians is something that we all can experience because death is coming for us all a resonance, a heartfelt emotion that without assisted dying that is constitutional, that doesn't discriminate arbitrarily against people because of their age or their diagnosis, that that could be them. That if they're in an institution where they can't have an assisted death and a transfer is just so hard that they get denied access to an assisted death, that could be all of us. And so it will be the year of the personal story. And I want to end with this one last piece, or almost end with this one last piece. I was at the second uh, uh, conference for the Canadian Association for Made Assessors and Providers uh, back in um, the beginning of May. And I remember Jocelyn was the first person I saw when I walked into this very large room that had almost 300 people uh, from all different backgrounds uh, in attendance at this conference. And I looked up and I saw this and I thought to myself, the future has arrived. There is Dying with Dignity Canada's logo with Health Canada and the Canadian Medical Association. My friends, Dying with Dignity Canada was started in 1980 in Toronto by Marilyn Seguin. That is a project 38 years in the making.